I thought today we need to go back to basics. And I think it's, I just feel the challenge to take some really simple, basic, biblical truths that each one of us needs to know and apply in our lives. And that's what I'm aiming to do. And I've got four simple things that I've pulled out of this psalm. We're looking at Psalm 27 if you've got a Bible. But as human beings, we all have basic needs. And when I looked uh, online at different things, this is the list of basic needs that you need as a human being. You need breath, you need food, water, shelter, and sleep. There's more complex needs that we need. There's the relational needs, there's the, the sense of purpose, all these sort of things. But if you don't have the basic needs, there's no point having a job, there's no point having good friendships if you haven't got food. You won't be able to make the friendships work. We need these basic needs. And as I looked at those, I thought, how many of those seem to la link up with the language God uses in his word? That we need the breath of God. We need to know the breath of God in our, that, that sense of being born again. That imagery of the dry bones and the breath of God bringing life to them. We need spiritual life. We need food. We need God's word. We need nourishment. We need water. Often in the Bible, water is illustrated uh, or illustrative of the Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit of God in our lives. We need shelter. And as I'll talk about later on, we need the home, the house of God. We need to feel a place of shelter and we need sleep. We need rest in God. We need to know what it is to rest in God. We need to know what it is to be still before God. And as I looked at those, it's interesting, isn't it, how God uses the everyday thing to help us understand what we need. Those are the basic needs, and I think those also are our basic spiritual needs. So we're looking at Psalm 27, four basic things that I've pulled out from here. Let's start at the beginning. <coughs> Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? When evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. And my first simple basic point is that this is a year where I need to be confident in God. I need to be confident in God. I think I do this, and I think maybe one or two of us, or maybe all of us do this, we forget who God is. God just becomes another person who might let us down, or another person who we might meet, and we forget that he is the awesome creator. We forget that he is the one that was before and is in and will always be. We forget he is the one who created all things and sustains all things, holds all things together. And I think sometimes we forget that God is amazing. He is the almighty God. And that is why we can have confidence in him. We can, <coughs> we can have confidence because of who he is. See, I can be confident in God for my salvation, I can be confident in God for my protection. Because he is a God who I can, I can have confidence in. How do we build this confidence? I think the more we get to know him, the more we understand his promises, the more we understand who he is, the more confidence we'll get. And one simple way, as we've heard already, is just to read his word. It's to understand who our almighty, amazing God is. To read about him, to understand, to learn about him. <coughs> There's a sense theology allows us to understand more about God, and as we understand more about God, I hope our faith and our confidence in him will, will increase, because we realise who he is. So maybe a basic truth for today. Can we have more confidence in God this year? Can we trust him because of who he is? Can we decide to 
to dig into who he is and, and just rely on him. Let's carry on in the psalm, psalm uh, verse 4. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the one thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. For he will conceal me there when troubles come. He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. Then I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me. At his sanctuary I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy, singing and praising the Lord with music. This psalm, we don't quite know when it was written. It's written by David. It is probably written while David is being pursued by enemies. So he's nowhere near the house of the Lord, the temple. He is out in the wilderness being pursued by enemies, quite likely one of his own children, because there's quite a few cases. So being pursued by Absalom, or, or, and they want to kill him, because they want to take the kingdom. They want to, uh, to take that from him. There is a fear there. He's far away from the temple but he's looking back and saying, this is what I want. This is what I want. My simple truth here is, could this be a year where we love his house? We love his house. That we say, actually, God, your house, and <coughs> it's church. For us, the house of God is here. It's this community. It's, it's us. It's not the building. It's us as a community. Can we love this house and his house? Can we find safety and refuge here? Now, I know I'm going to just go through something, and I know for, for, for some people here, um, <coughs> I'm going to talk about home. And I'm going to talk about home as a place of safety, security, and for you it probably isn't. And I know for some people, this is a trouble, when we use an analogy, it jars against your own reality. But just listen to this, because a home should be, a home should be a place of basic needs. A home should be a place of security. A home should be a place where you grow and you thrive. And a home should be a place where you are valued and a place of relationship. And can I turn that around and say the house of God, the home of God, should be a place where your basic needs are met. It should be a place of security. It should be a place where you grow and thrive. It should be a place of value and relationship. That's what you should find here, and I hope you do. My challenge to each one of us is how do we help that be the case? How do we help make this a place of security, a place where people can grow and thrive? And how can this be the place where we want to be? While I was um, pulling this talk together, uh, I often find that one in the morning, I, 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 I'm lying in bed, can't get to sleep, and my brain goes through talks and all sorts of other things. And my brain decided to work out how many times I had been to church <laughs> in, my, in my Christian life. I don't know why I do that one in the morning, but I was... And um, I worked out, you know, probably for normal Sunday services, I've probably been to 1,700, 1,700 different services. You know what? Sometimes, for some of us, maybe that statement, I will love his house, we've lost because of familiarity. How do you keep, how do you keep something fresh when you've gone to 1,700 services and probably sung the same song 500 times? and heard the same message. <laughs> um, that's is new and fresh, hopefully. Um, but how do you keep that? Well, I think God puts two things in place to help us keep that. One, passion, love. It's passion and love that helps something keep alive. The one th David here says, the one thing I ask, it's a love that keeps us together. And if you are finding church difficult... Ask God to increase your love for others. Ask God to give you eyes to see other people as he does. 
And before you know it, you'll be in love with the church again. Because you'll see people, and you'll see individuals, and you'll see the potential, and you'll see them grow. Ask for more love. And the second thing I think God gives us to keep a freshness is him. This is the house of God. You know, if I was to perform 1,700 services in my own strength, they would be pretty boring. And you would be become bored. Thankfully, it's not in my strength, it's in his strength, it's his spirit that brings a freshness and a life to all that we do. And it's as we see God in the small, in the, in the insignificant, and we look for the glory of God in those moments, as we look for the goodness of God in each other, it's at those moments that we will see him at work. So ask God, or look out for God at work across the church. Let me just mention this one, because I, I feel I need to. Um, it's something I've, I've talked about a few years ago. But it's, it's this language, this, this analogy. This is a home, not a hotel. Church is a home, not a hotel. In a hotel, you are served hopefully well, but you have expectations. Sarah and I went to a hotel uh, recently in Scarborough, um, a certain chain that I won't mention, but there's lots of them. Um, and um, on the day we arrived, we'll just say overnight, their computer system had broken down. And they said, oh, um, yeah, you're in room 127. Here's your, your, your card. So we walk up the stairs to room 127, put the thing in the door, open the door, think, looks a bit messy. And then uh, a few minutes later, Sarah realised, you know, later, you know, there's someone's suitcase there. There's someone's trousers on the bed. <laughs> They've given us the wrong key. So we very quickly went back down to her and said, excuse me, you've given us the wrong key here. Oh, so, sorry, so, sorry, sorry. We had expectations. Oh, no, 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 you're, yeah, you're, you're in room 157. Here you go, sir. So we go up to room 157, and Sarah just... Just as a laugh, as she puts the key in the door, says, hello, anyone in there? And someone goes, yes, I am. <laughs> and this time, there was a couple sat on the bed. Thankfully, just sat on the bed. <laughs> we have expectations if about a hotel. And likewise, therefore, we make judgments. You just need to go on TripAdvisor. For this hotel, particular hotel on TripAdvisor, one of the comments were someone was, gave it one star because they were complaining about the noise of the seagulls <laughs> in Scarborough. <laughs> People will make judgments uh, about things. And if you don't like a particular hotel, you just go, actually, I'll just go to a different hotel and, they, and, and look for the serving there. But the church isn't a hotel. Church is a home. This is where all of us have a role. In a home, we all have a role and a responsibility. Now, you may have, in a home situation, you may have a specific task. You might be, uh, uh, you know, we've lost, with, with, with our two girls uh, moving out, we've lost the dishwasher emptiers. They were really good at emptying the dishwashers. Now, we've got to do it. Um, um, that was their job. Um, and so you may have a role. But we also all have a part to play that, that we just get on and do. You don't, I, I hope, and maybe there's a few parents that will need to talk to your children about this, um, but I hope you don't sort of sit there thinking, well, no one's picked up the empty coffee cup off the table and, and get annoyed. You just pick it up and go and take it to where it needs to be, hopefully. Um, we all have a part to play. We all have a stake and a responsibility. We have a responsibility just to be part of and to help and to make happen. What's our responsibility here in this house of God? Well, as Rob mentioned, there's the one another's. As we one another each other, as we encourage, as we spur each other on, as we pray for each other, as we uh, just allow each other to flourish, be that through the life groups or here on a Sunday or other contexts in teams. There is a need to serve. As a church, we do need people to serve. All that happens 
happens off the back of volunteers. And we are still a little bit tight in a few areas and a few practical ones that you, I really do want you to consider. We do need maybe one or two more people for the, the tech side in terms of a sound desk and um, the, the audio, vi the visuals uh, to help in there. We also need more people to help with the kids' work that we do need extra helpers for those, uh, and those willing to step up and take a lead in terms of leading a group, not just helping in the group. We do need that, or else we just can't, we can't do what we want to do if we don't have the volunteers. And so maybe we just wear, as a home, you just get on and do sometimes. You know, I, I don't know, has anyone ever said at home, I just don't feel cool to do washing up? I just really don't feel cool to do the washing up this, you know, it's just, it's just not, it's not in my gift mix. <laughs> you get on and you do. And there are times when we just need to get on and do, and this is the house of God. We also need to minister to one another. We need to, this is a place where, you know, don't, if someone needs prayer, don't bring them to me. Pray for them. Pray for them. You can pray for them. You can minister. You can support. If you see someone in need across the congregation, Go and be that support. Don't wait for someone else to do it. This is where we all have a role to play. And we also have a role to play in terms of giving. Um, <coughs> I uh, this kind of ages me, but I just remember the TV programme Bread. Do you remember the TV programme Bread? It's probably not a great analogy for uh, giving uh, in terms of where the money came from, but there was that sense of sat around the table and they all were giving the money in to the house to support the, the running of the house. And we need to give. We need to give. Everything that we do is off the back of the generosity of you as individuals. We do need. We're, we're still probably just a little bit short of our basic needs for the year. We want to invest as well. We're just a little bit short of the basics. So we do need each of us to give. And please, if you're already giving, I'm not having a go at people already giving. We can all prayerfully consider, do we need to increase our giving because unfortunately for church electricity bills have gone up just as much if, if not more than domestic bills costs have gone up but uh, we've just invested and I, I hope it's made a difference it's hard to tell but two thousand pounds in cavity wall insulation on the outside walls so that went in yes uh, on tuesday hopefully that will make a difference in here but you see that that, that costs this sort of money has to, and that comes from us. But anyway, I, I don't want to keep going on about that. Because the house of God should be the place where we find safety. The house of God should be the place where we find security and we find significance. As it says here, we are placed upon a rock. Yes, the storms, the battles, the hardships are real. But we should find safety in the house of God as we are supported and encouraged by the people around us. And I hope that is your experience, and I hope that is your experience in terms of being a support and a help to others. Two more points, let me, let me rush on. Jumping on to uh, verse 7. Hear me as I pray, O Lord, be merciful and answer me. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. My third basic thing is, I think this needs to be a year where we choose to pursue God. I will pursue God. Please, we don't... If we do all the things I've just talked about, the serving and the doing, out of our own strength, or because I've chivied you along, then we'll get bored or we'll get frustrated. But as we pursue God, and as we respond to God, we will serve. And as we respond to God and his generosity, we will be generous. And as we respond to the ministry of God into our lives, we will minister to others. It's because we pursue God that we then are able to do. There's a sense that what we do, we do as a response to God. Not a response to me, we should do it as a response to God. It should be a response of what we do. We don't give because we're told to give. We give because God is generous. And so on. 
For me, I can get lost in the doing. And I can get caught up in the doing, and I could become too focused on that. And I apologize in terms of to you as a church for the times where I've given you a disservice because I've become too focused on doing and not enough focus on being. Because you don't get the best me if I'm just doing. I can do okay. I think I'm fairly competent at quite a few things, and I can do okay. But I don't think okay is good enough. And I think I need, for myself this year, to be more focused on the being, on being a child of God, on being in his presence, on being just there, and then out of that, allow the doing to flow. And I think for each one of us, we need to do that as well. We need to be more focused on the being with God than the doing. Now, it, it can jar a little bit, can't it? Because I've just been talking about lots of doing things. But I hope you can hear me right. Our motivation should be about because we have been with God that we then want to do these things. So how do we pursue God? Well, I could talk about we must read our Bible, we must pray, we must this, we must, but again, I get, I'm back to the doing again, aren't I? How do we pursue God? I think the psalmist sums it up really well at the end. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. How do you pursue God? You just wait for him. You just wait for him. You just sit in his presence. It's that simple. In some respects, if we, if we wait on God, I think we'll, 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 we'll experience his presence. As we experience his presence, I think that will respond into us doing all these things. My temptation is just to focus on the doing. I think we need to come back all the way over here. Let's wait on God. As we go into a week of prayer, the temptation can be prayer list. Don, 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 don. We must pray about these things. Let's wait on God. Let's wait in his presence. Let's just receive what he has for us as we wait patiently for him. I was thinking about waiting, uh, and I just picked up um, these three I- images. There's, I'm sure there's different kinds, more different kinds of waiting, but these are three that, I, that came to mind. Um, and... Uh, certainly the, the first two I've experienced uh, through last year. You have maybe had that waiting in an airport because the plane's delayed. And that's a boring waiting. That really is boring as you're waiting and you're just watching the time tick over. Um, and it keeps saying delay, 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 delay. And we're probably very asleep, very, you know, <laughs> If you're not careful, you can almost wait and miss the opportunity because you become so bored. Maybe you're more righteous than me, but have you ever become frustrated in, the, in your waiting? Anyone get a little bit cross and angry in queues? Anyone here? Are, is anyone the kind of person that pulls out to block the second lane because they're annoyed at people going past? We, we, we pick Katie... I, we, we, we experienced both of these back in December. We picked Katie up from the airport um, down in Heathrow. We had to wait for a couple of hours. They were just stuck on the plane. So we, we were a, a good hour, two hours waiting in the airport. And then I thought, oh, great. Yeah, 11 o'clock at night, we'll just drive straight home. I forget that 11 o'clock at night, they shut all the motorways for, for works, and there were massive diversions. And we were stuck in a motorway queue at uh, one in the morning. The sat-nav said, you will arrive in Nottingham at 7 a.m. <laughs> it's like, ah! Oh! Uh, and, and we had the both, the bored and then the frustrated waiting, where we become impatient or angry. I don't think either of those are what the psalmist is saying. I don't think we should wait bored for God. I don't think we should wait angrily for God. But I think the third example I've got here of the sprinter on the blocks as we wait, attentive and ready. But we're waiting for God to say, go. But we're ready to respond. That's the kind of waiting I think the psalmist is asking us to do. As we wait in confidence, as we wait to, uh, 
for, for his response. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. And can I encourage each one of us this week as we go into this week of prayer, come and connect. You'll, you'll see I've used on the various things this, this um, analogy of the sprinter on the blocks for the publicity for this week. Let's wait expectantly for God as we hear what he wants us to do, as we respond to him. Let's wait in prayer. Let's wait for him to come to us. So four really simple things. Let's wait on God. And as we wait on God, let's pursue his presence. And as we pursue his presence, let's love his church and love the people that he's placed around us as we, we, we work and see the house of God built. And as we see the house of God built, let's have the confidence that he is, the one who he says he is. And let me just finish with this little phrase, because this comes right at the end, of, uh, uh, just before the end of the Psalms. And I'm praying for myself for this, because I can feel a little bit discouraged at times, um, and I just pray for myself. Verse 13, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Can that be our prayer this year? I remain confident of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I don't know what you're facing this year, but I pray that you will see the goodness of God this year in your situation, in your circumstance, in your life, in your, your, uh, your position. Let me pray. Jesus, may we, each one of us, may we fall more in love with you this year. May we choose to pursue you. Not your things, not your actions, but pursue you. To wait before you, to be in your presence. And I pray, Holy Spirit, come and just warm our hearts up. I have confidence, God, that as we pursue you, all those other things happen. But may we pursue you. Put a love back in our hearts for you, God. Put a passion in our bellies, as we prayed already, that just is after you. And may we be a people who pursue you this year and see you do great things, and see your goodness in the land of the living. We step into this year, Lord, waiting for you, patiently and expectantly. So come, Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Be Lord of our lives, be Lord of this church. We love you. Amen. I've seen you move.